Have you ever wondered why everybody is so sick? From the common cold to severe viruses like the flu or the COVID flu, to serious dysfunctions in our bodies like autoimmune issues, malfunctions and infections in our body systems, to potentially deadly disease? The better question may be, why in our 21st century are these issues not being cured by the so-called experts? Now, I've experienced a debilitating autoimmune illness for over 30 years of my life, a devastating malfunction in my reproductive system, and I bore the weight of physical and emotional pain and the shame of infertility, which was somehow connected with this mysterious and improperly diagnosed and treated illness for decades. As hard as I tried and as much time and trust I gave to these experts in medicine, nothing ever worked, nothing was cured, God didn't heal me, and I suffered directly from these health issues and indirectly as they negatively impacted every area of my life, my relationships, my livelihood, my career. And to this day, I don't have as many answers as I'd like. Now, have you ever been diagnosed with something potentially deadly, but miraculously experienced healing? I have. In 2020, at the height of COVID and lockdown, I was being shuffled from hospital to hospital for numerous tests and subsequent surgery due to a mass in my right breast the size of a dime. And I was told that the cells contained within this mass were cancer cells, and not just any kind of cancer cells, but a triple negative cancer. Now, every cancer diagnosis is unique, but in general, a triple negative cancer means it's a more aggressive type of tumor with a faster growth rate, a higher risk of spreading and recurrence risk. And I was told that that's the typical, more common outlook. And yet through faith and a just as aggressive prayer to the God who heals, I was led to request the least invasive course of action, a lumpectomy and a lymph node biopsy. And praise God, the tumor was removed and there was no evidence of cancer. And yet, I was somewhat pressured by my oncologist to go through an aggressive form of chemotherapy and radiation with the justification that we should attack your healthy cells just in case they may develop cancer cells in the future. To which my aggressive faith in God, the God who heals, replied, I'm good. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to live a clean lifestyle. I'm going to take vitamins, eat a well-balanced diet, and in adhering to an aggressive mammogram schedule twice a year, not shown any evidence of cancer. And I feel wonderful. Now, of course, I'm not trying to come off cocky. I know tomorrow something can change. Heck, someone can get run over by a car on her way to a chemotherapy appointment. So this is life, right? All right, last question. Have you ever questioned or expressed anger to God for a debilitating illness that is not improving or losing a loved one due to a physical illness? I have. I lost dozens of friends and family members, many Christians, and if I survey these deaths, 99% occurred due to illness. Not a natural, beyond 90 years of age, died in his or her sleep kind of a death, but a death due to illness, diabetes, heart disease, a cancer, And my feeling is that none of these loved ones deserve to suffer or die. And not to mention, I've questioned and expressed anger to God many a times because I couldn't understand, especially as a Christian, why God would allow me, someone who not only prayed to be a mom from when I was a kid, but loved children and blessed children at my every opportunity I could to never experience pregnancy or childbirth, the most precious and sacred thing a woman can do. I'll share more about my experiences later, but the point is, I spent a lot of time questioning and expressing anger to God, practically blaming him for this fate. To be more precise, I would ask things like, how could you allow this? Or why would you want this for me? Now, in my last message, it was about making decisions and how the most important decision you can ever make is to reject what the world and the so-called experts tell you and accept what the word says. And by reading the Bible, you will develop faith. Because the word says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You will understand who God is and who you are as his beloved creation. And you will acknowledge that you are a sinner and in need of a savior. And best of all, you will know that Jesus not only paid for your sins to secure your place in heaven, but he came to give you an abundant life right now. Now, I think we can all agree that the world is full of evil and division and chaos And many of us can easily determine it's a result of sin. But what about the chaos that occurs in our physical bodies? 
never mind the world for a minute because there's relatively little we can do to change what's going on out there. But compare that to what we do have control over in our own physical bodies. And let's be honest, even as Christians, we still sin. We continue to sin. So I think the question we should be asking is, is there some connection of sin with sickness? And if so, how do we make sense of the undeserving ones, you know, the babies and the children who are suffering and dying before they're even old enough to sin? Why do they develop sickness? And why do some of them sadly die from their illness? I mean, is there a greater potential that is offered to us through the God who gave us Jesus? the one who was wounded for our sin and provided healing by his stripes. In today's message, we're going to reconcile the fact that the world is full of so-called experts and man-made protocols that, good intentioned or not, are not helping us thrive. And from there, we're going to look at the Word and see what God says in terms of his intention for our good and how we can be fully aligned to his purpose no matter what comes our way, the good and the bad, the healing experiences, and the painful, never-to-be-cured ones as well, we can still decide to thrive. So please, please stick around. We have a lot to talk about. All right, before we get into my story and the word, I want to look at the world, specifically the most recent global meeting of the minds and the billionaires, the recent World Economic Forum their annual consortium event that took place a little over a week ago in Davos, Switzerland. And for those of you who don't know, the WEF is an international non-governmental organization for public-private sector collaboration. It was founded in 1971 by German engineer Klaus Schwab, author of The Great Reset. And he makes his agenda pretty clear when he says systemic transformation and uses communist China as a role model. A few years ago, the WEF posted a short video outlining their goals and predictions for the world by the year 2030. The video is titled Eight Predictions for the World in 2030. And it starts with, you will own nothing and be happy. And you'll have drones and robots doing all the work for you. And the United States won't be the world's superpower before it pans to a photo of national flags with China front and center. And let's see, there will be no need for organ transplants because they'll be able to just print them out with a 3D printer. And we won't be needing any meat or farmers for that matter because we'll be eating bugs. It's better for the environment. In a nutshell, they're not happy that the United States is its own country with its own laws And up until the Biden administration, legal requirements with safety measures in place in order to come into our country. And I'm not joking. This is not a conspiracy theory. And the mainstream media will make you think anyone who calls out the lunacy and the evil agendas are the problem. So do yourself a favor and do your own research. Schwab and his socialist global entity is trying to pave the way to a world order system in which America is stripped away of her freedoms and completely dependent on the elites. The elites, the billionaires, you know, who fly their fuel emission jets to meetings to talk about solving the world's problems. But here's the problem with these so-called problem solvers. Number one, they lost trust and they know it. The theme of their last consortium was rebuilding trust. You see, after they pushed their influence on a global lockdown in conjunction to a global pandemic that they certainly missed in preventing or giving us warning or saving lives, they supported a lockdown that just so happened to close down and destroy everything good and pure. Churches were shut down. Private businesses were closed. Everyday Americans couldn't say goodbye to their dying relatives while big box stores and strip clubs remained open. BLM was allowed to protest and cause destruction. And the elites were all caught on camera not wearing their masks, traveling to visit their loved ones on their deathbeds, and the economy today is completely wrecked. So they missed the mark, and their radical ideas ended up doing more harm than good. Secondly, they claim to have the answers to solve problems that aren't definitive problems. I mean, what exactly needs to change in climate control? Are we running too hot or are we running too cold? Or I don't know, is God calling the shots and we're somewhere in the middle? Not to mention, there's a long punch list of problems that are clearly identified, problems we should all be on board with that need resolutions, and yet they don't mention any of them. Here's an idea. Fix something. Fix anything. Fix the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Fix the Israelis held hostage for over 100 days problem. Fix the ISIS problem. Fix the homeless problem. Fix the fentanyl problem. Fix the sex trafficking problem. And here's a crazy idea. 
Prove that you actually care about lives. Stop lying about what constitutes life because science even proves that life begins in the womb. And maybe you can fix the needless abortion problem because there's millions of babies that have been murdered as a birth control method. This is why I pray that Donald Trump will be our president in 2024 because he has proven he cannot be bought and he's the only one who is not afraid to call out these global billionaire elites. He's not afraid to stand up for what America was founded on, our Judeo-Christian values. And that is why he has an enormous amount of support because our country has more right-thinking individuals over radical left-thinking individuals. The United States is special because it's the only country that was founded on godly principles by God-fearing men and women. And our God is faithful. I don't think he'll ever forget that. All right, speaking of God, I'm going to get a little deeper here. I'm now going to show you how destructive these worldly entities are in terms of making a mockery of God and how easy it is for someone to be misguided. You know, kind of like how the devil misguided Adam and Eve to take a bite of an apple. Just a harmless little apple, right? An apple that led to their death. And then I'm going to show you the connection between the devil's objective, which is deceiving people into disobeying God, and how this is connected to our sicknesses. That's right. I'm suggesting that we are suffering in our health today because of the root of the problem due to disobedience to God. From there, I'll share a little more of my experience with a debilitating health issue that was never healed versus one that was a potential death sentence that never took root. But I'll share how God wants to use any and every experience for our good. Good did come out of my pain and suffering. And last but not least, I'll show how we, specifically those who have placed our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and are therefore saved, have access to God's Spirit which is all we need to overcome the devastation of sickness. So last week I shared my reaction to the opening ceremony of the World Economic Forum event in Davos, which was kicked off by a chief test of the Amazonian Yawunawu tribe located in Brazil. Now she performed a shamanic rite, which included blowing on the heads of the leaders of this forum. Leaders like the director of the International Monetary Fund, the president of the World Bank, the CEO of Ikea, and other billionaire elites. Sadly, most people will look at this like, huh, cool, sharing our culture. We should show an appreciation and respect to others. And the host of the event justified all this by stating that to look to the future, we must look back and see what the wishes of our ancestors were. Kind of like a Kamala Harris word salad, right? We push to move forward, unburdened by what has been. <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, seems harmless, right? Virtue-like, giving an opportunity for her to perform a ritual from her indigenous tribe. And she's a female shaman, so we should respect that, right? Now, what is shamanism? Or sh some say shamanism. Now, according to Wikipedia, it's a religious practice that involves a practitioner interacting with the spirit world through altered states of consciousness, such as a trance. The goal of this is usually to direct spirits or spiritual energies into the physical world for the purpose of healing, divination, or to aid human beings in some other way. Now, I want to read what Wikipedia, how it defines divination. It's the attempt to gain insight into a question or a situation by way of an occultic ritual or practice. Seems harmless? Like eating that apple? Shamanism is basically a, an occult. And we're all familiar with the thou shalt not have any other gods before me. But occultism is characterized by a reliance on the supernatural powers. Now we're going beyond worshiping something, but actually, you know, calling on the powers of something that is not coming from God. The only other power that is available in the spiritual realm is the works of the devil. And there's dozens, maybe even hundreds of varieties of occultism. Some are more subtle, like acupuncture or horoscopes. Some are a little more progressive, like fortune tellers and crystals, um, or tr trying to interact with someone who has passed on to the more severe witchcraft, casting spells, worshiping the devil, or participating in a seance. Now, it kind of works similarly to drugs, where there is a, a gateway drug that can lead you down a more dangerous and severe path. So, um, and it just so happens that in these indigenous tribes, 
like the Yawunawu, they rely heavily on hallucinating and using natural drugs to accompany their involvement with the occult. Now, I found a personal testimony on YouTube that was translated into English of a former shaman of a similar tribe called Yanamamo. And his name was Chief Shufoot. I'll put the link in my YouTube description box if you want to check it out for yourself. But he shares, uh, by the way, he, he comes to know the Lord and he was saved, but he talks about when he was a shaman and just how awful it was to be in the tribe and grow up this way. And subsequently, his role as he also calls it a witch doctor, he spent most of his years crippled in fear and hatred which he attributes to the practice of drinking human bones, inviting multiple spirits into his chest to supposedly equip him in healing and leading his people and taking very powerful drugs, as he puts it, blowing dope up my nose as a regular practice of receiving power from a former shaman. And in his testimony, he says, once he discovered the Holy Spirit of God, he was immediately changed and he will never go back to the former primitive yet demonic way of life. All right. And I want you to think for a minute, because even in our God ordained country of America, where we are as advanced as can be for, from civilizations that are far more primitive, I want you to think for a moment just how saturated our culture is with the occult. And how much interest there is nowadays in the occult, which has been promoted by the New Age movement and the rise of paganism and Wicca. It's in our books. It's in our movies. It's in our music. I mean, every time I visit a quaint little town with a quaint little shops, you know, there's always at least one shop that has occult paraphernalia from crystals to art to images and jewelry that is connected to an occult practice. Some of these Mexican restaurants even have occult-like paraphernalia. Now I want you to think about your life, your past experiences, your past relationships, your past involvement, and even things you did as a kid. I'll use myself as an example and disclose that I had friends when I was younger, um, when I would you know, go to slumber parties or so forth, that were participating in using Ouija boards. Now, thankfully, I became saved as a young child. My parents became saved when I was a baby. And so I never participated. In fact, once I even asked my parents to pick me up from a slumber party because I didn't want to participate in the Ouija board. But nevertheless, I was somewhat subjected in that way. Now, my parents also forbade us from listening to heavy metal rock music. And thankfully, I never really had an ear for it anyway. And a lot of our pop music today contains lyrics that Sometimes when you play them forward or backward, it doesn't matter, but they're basically worshiping the devil. So there's that. But there's also, you know, a lot of times, you know, we could have innocently, you know, had our horoscopes read or on the boardwalk, lots of fortune tellers and so forth. So I want you to think about just how saturated our culture is and then your personal life to really get a sense of how much exposure or involvement, direct or indirect, that you've had with this. I think it's important for us to do. Now, I'm not going to get into Halloween, but that's even something that I sh a struggle with because it's everywhere. And when you have a child, especially when they go to a public school, it's very difficult to navigate that. And by the way, these are topics that I want to get into in future podcasts because we're going to you know, really work through all of this stuff. But my point is, it's everywhere. The occult can be very subtle. But it's everywhere in our 21st century, you know, advanced, civilized culture in America. Now, I want to take a moment and show you what God says about the occult in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Please turn with me there. It says, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, and he's talking to the Israelites in the land that he gave them, he says, do not learn to Imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive those nations out before you. But you must be blameless before the Lord your God. Now I'm going to summarize what God says about the blessings of obedience and the curses of disobedience. Just 10 chapters from this one. 
uh, Deuteronomy 28. You know what? Before I do that, let me remind you, the book of Deuteronomy means second law. It's written a little bit in response to after the Israelites were rebelling after those 40 years in, in the wilderness. So they needed to be reminded of these things because they were, in fact, falling into these occult practices. So in chapter 28, I'm going to summarize this, but I want you to read it for yourself. So in summary, the blessings would be um, to elevate them above the surrounding nations. He promises to bless their cities, their fields, their fertility, and their livestock. And he tells them that they'll have victories over their enemies and a treasury full of gold. Verse 15 to 68, some, I'm going to summarize the curses of disobedience. And think about it. These are things that are still happening today and have happened even in the Old Testament. If the Israelites fail to respect God's law, God told them their cities, fields, fertility, and livestock would be cursed. He would introduce confusion and frustration, disease that would be permitted to run rampant in their land. Israel's enemies would, con would defeat them in battle. They would be oppressed continually. Foreign kings would rule over them. The Lord would make them serve wicked men. Their children would be taken captive. The Israelites would be shamed. They would become a horror, a proverb, and a byword among the nations. God would send armies to besiege their cities. And extraordinary afflictions, affliction severe and lasting, and sickness grievous and lasting. And God would take the promised land away from them and scatter them throughout the nations. I really would like for you to read chapter 28 um, yourselves and, and, and pray on that. But I will say, over the past year, I believe God not only revealed the most insight to me because I pursued it. This time last year in the winter and spring, I was back into a season of depression, which I had been struggling with on and off since I was 40. It was right around the time I started with infertility treatments, by the way. Not sure if there's a connection, but anyhow, um, James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. It will be given to him. So I started there and I was relentless because a year ago I was at my wits end. And what's really interesting is it was beyond being tired of the depression. I got to a point where I was settling into it. And my attitude became, this is it. This is in the cards for me. I literally said that. This is in the cards for me. I mean, what a worldly occult-like statement that is, right? And I said this. I said it out loud. I said it to my husband. I said, this is it. This is where I belong. And I was reflecting on my life and, you know, th those years of suffering with so much sickness and even though I was healed from the breast cancer, to which, you know, to this day, I'm, I'm very grateful, but I was never able to reconcile why I suffered for so many years. I trusted those doctors, the medicines that ended up making me more sick. And there's a possibility that some of those medications made it more impossible for me to get pregnant. But anyway, you know, here I am depressed again, and I'm, I'm just starting to, to get comfortable with it. And I decided, you know, to pursue the knowledge of God. I was at my wit's end, but yet I was still pursuing the knowledge of God, not the, not the worldly knowledge. And I had to turn off even, even some friends that were trying to give me advice. I just knew that God was calling me to know that there was more for me. I knew there was more for me. And so help me, when I got to that place, there was a horrific battle I felt over me when I slept many restless nights. It felt like demons and angels were wrestling right on top of me. Words cannot express the pressure I felt. It was very uncomfortable. But through it all, something in my heart was telling me, hold on. I felt the Lord saying, I already dealt with your sickness. By my stripes, you are healed. And I realized that for decades as a Christian, I thought that relying on Jesus for my salvation was all I needed. I knew I was going to heaven someday. And as a Christian, I was guaranteed every promise in the Bible. And I was exempt from curses or consequences of sin and the sin of others and the world I'm in. But friends, I was lacking in divine spirit-led knowledge. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. So at the very least, we don't need to agree, but I'm going to challenge you to pray to God for knowledge. Now, here's how I did it. And here's what I believe may help you. The first thing is I prayed for God to reveal if there was anything going on 
that I couldn't see that was hindering me from being healed. Now, again, at this time, it's depression. But those 35 years of sickness was endometriosis. That's what I dealt with. It was called endometriosis. It was an awful, debilitating health issue that God did allow me to go through. But he, I believe, graciously cut my reproductive years short. I got my period late and I went through menopause early. (laughs) So he literally shortened those years of of pain for me. But at this point last year, it was the, the depression. And it was just as debilitating, if not more than anything else, because it was like a switch going off in my brain. And I couldn't do much at all. So I prayed for knowledge, not by the not by means of the world through the occult, but through the word and God's Holy Spirit. And I'll get into in a second because you need to rely on God's spirit for this knowledge. But he revealed to me areas in my life, sin from my past, and get this, sin from others that I was affected by. Yes, as a Christian, just like a baby and a child, as innocent as can be, even Christians can be affected by the reality of sickness and death. And he revealed everything, the sins that I glossed over, especially during the years after my divorce, sins from my family, sins from past generations, sins from relationships and people that I had influencing me, as well as experiences in which I was involved in, mostly naively, things that allowed the enemy to pull me into sickness over the years. Like I said, it was the endometriosis. I also dealt with mental health issues, which, by the way, fall under the physical health because the brain is an organ. So I suffered with something called premenstrual dysphoric disorder, the the infertility, the depression. But God showed me that I needed to repent of my sins. Even as a Christian, I needed to ask to be delivered. This is why Jesus taught us to pray. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, we overlook those four statements. We either don't ask to be forgiven, and we sin every day, right? So should, we should be asking for forgiveness more, more than just when we become a Christian. We should be forgiving others. How many Christians do you know that aren't willing to reconcile or forgive one another? We should also be asking God not to lead us into temptation and to deliver us from evil. All right. So that was the first step is I needed to repent. The second thing is God reminded me that Jesus addressed everything I needed at Calvary, not just what I needed after I die, but he addressed everything I needed for my life on earth. You see, he didn't only die for our sins and our salvation. He died for our healing. He died to set us free. So the second thing God showed me was that there was more for me than just the joy of my salvation. All right, friends, here's the most important part of the message. So I want you to get your Bibles again. Now I'm going to show you what the Bible says about the relationship and distinction between sin and sickness, salvation and physical healing, and water baptism versus Holy Spirit baptism. These are all things the Holy Spirit helped me to see, especially over the past year. And I can now say I am living the abundant life Jesus promised. So I want that for you especially in your physical healing, because unless and until you are physically able and fully aligned with the potential God has for you, you cannot be effective nor productive in your life, not consistently, and certainly not fully aligned to the way God intends for you. All right, first, there's a relationship between sin and sickness, with some exceptions. Now, aside from Deuteronomy, it was relatively known throughout the Jewish nation throughout the Old Testament, that sin was in conjunction to sickness. And my interpretation is that physical health issues were rooted in doing something that went against God's law and provisions, something even as simple as eating unclean foods. Now, leprosy, which is today known as Hansen's disease, was a bacterial infection. Today, we have a cure for it, but my assertion is we have cures for things that can be traced back to the root of the problem, which was mishandling God's law and provisions. Deuteronomy chapter 14 will outline all of the foods that God told us to eat or not eat. And some of the issues, by the way, and sicknesses, if we don't follow that completely, aren't, you know, might not be that major. I want to look at now John 5, because here 
I'll just read it. It says, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. There is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool uh, called Beth Bethesda and is surrounded by five covered colonnades. And there was a great number of disabled people that used to lie there, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and he learned that he had been in the condition for a long time, he asked, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool. So Jesus says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. Now this took place on the Sabbath. Go down a few verses and it says in verse 14, later Jesus found him at the temple and he says to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. There it is. I can give you more verses, but that's me is enough. Now, there are exceptions of those who get sick without a connection to sin. And there's a purpose. And that is for God to work through it for good. Like Job, perfect example. Job did not deserve everything that happened to him, but God used it for his good. In fact, he ended up blessing Job for, you know, not cursing God, even though everyone told him to curse God. Now, in uh, John 9, we will see an explanation for this. So I'm going to read uh, John 9, 1 to 4. As Jesus passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? But Jesus said, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. Night is coming when no one can work. So there are times, there are exceptions that people, children, for example, um, there can be an illness, but God does have a greater purpose through it. And that is something that I needed to reconcile that Jesus helped me to see by bringing me to these passages. You know, in looking back, God reminded me, that everything that happened to me in my past and not being able to get pregnant or conceive, I ended up with the most beautiful boy that my husband and I adopted. And I couldn't imagine any other child being more perfect for me and my husband. And uh, I, God just worked through it all. And, and, and there was great blessings that came out of it. So the next thing that God revealed to me was that the Bible makes a clear distinction and connection between physical healing and the casting out of demons prior to physical healing. Now, I would defer you to any of the Gospels in reading about Jesus' work and ask yourself, why did he cast out demons? Why did he want his disciples to go about casting out demons. I mean, what was the importance? What was the relevancy? I believe there's enough evidence to support that Jesus healed those who were righteous and he cast out demons from those who were righteous. And we have to understand righteousness in the Old Testament or even before Jesus died on the cross is the equivalent to salvation after the resurrection and in the New Testament. So Luke 13 tells us that Jesus healed a righteous woman who was disabled by a spirit. Here's what it says. Look this up yourself. Luke 13, starting in verse 10. As he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, a woman who had been disabled by a spirit for over 18 years was bent over and couldn't straighten up at all. When Jesus saw this, he calls out, woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid hands on her and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded to telling the crowd, there are six days we work. Blah, blah, blah. All right, I'll just forward. Basically, he was mad because he healed on the Sabbath. They were always looking for a way to trip him up. Sound familiar? And Jesus says, hypocrites, doesn't each one of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trowel on the Sabbath and lead it to water? Satan, listen, Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. So that a daughter of Abraham basically meant she was righteous. She was a righteous woman. Jesus healed this woman of a demonic spirit. He healed many people with demonic spirits. And so I do see a connection between physical healing and a demonic spirit. Now, last but not least, the Bible also supports evidence that it is the Holy Spirit that authorizes the power to heal. 
Jesus didn't perform miracles nor heal anyone, at least in scripture, until after he received the Holy Spirit, which subsequently enabled him to resist temptation. So if one wants to be physically healed, the Bible provides enough evidence to follow this prescription. You ready? Number one, repent of your sins. Confess your sins. Be saved. Put your trust in Jesus. All right, so as a Christian, we must confess our sins. Number two, be filled with the Holy Spirit by being baptized in the name of Jesus. The water baptism is different than a Holy Spirit baptism. A water baptism is a symbol, a public pledge of your new identity as a child of God. It goes hand in hand with our conversion, and yet it does not replace our salvation. 1 Peter 3.21 says the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. So for starters, understand that a water baptism usually goes hand in hand with being saved. However, it doesn't replace repenting and praying for Jesus to come into your heart. It's a symbol. It's a pledge. It is a part of becoming a Christian. Secondly, Jesus was baptized in water by John and he was subsequently baptized by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descended upon him. It was after that, it was after he was resurrected that he commands his disciples, commands, didn't ask, but commands them to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit, which eventually descended upon them at Pentecost. So they were as saved as can be. And yet it wasn't enough. Jesus told them, and they were most likely water baptized as well, but he tells them to wait for the descending of the Holy Spirit. So clearly there's a distinction there. More verses to show this. Acts 19, 1 to 6. Paul comes into Ephesus. There he finds some disciples and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John's baptism, or excuse me, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. You see the difference? Clear distinction. They said they were baptized by John's baptism, but Paul lays hands on them and I presume prayed over them and the Holy Spirit came upon them. Matthew 3, 11, John the Baptist says, I baptize, I baptize you with water for repentance. Again, it's that pledge. It's that demonstration of, you know, when you go down in the water, you're, you're saying goodbye to an old life and you're coming up new. You're now clean. You now have, you know, what Jesus did on the cross your new creation. Uh, he says, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to ca I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John 3, 5, Jesus answers, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Luke 3, 16, John answers all of them saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Again, two separate things. Last but not least, there's plenty more, but I leave you with Acts 10, 44 to 48. Peter is, staying, is saying these things and the Holy Spirit falls on them who hears the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declares, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Friends, there's just a few examples, but enough for me. There is a clear distinction between a water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So my advice, after you repent, you receive Jesus into your heart, a water baptism, and then don't give up. Ask or have someone pray for you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Pray for that, for the Holy Spirit. Even though I get it, I and I sometimes go back and forth. I'm like, okay, I know the Holy Spirit is, was working in me and he was present in me when I was saved, but it's not enough. 
It is not enough. This is a second act of baptism that is something Jesus commanded, and I believe it's something that we need to take seriously. All right, the last thing I want to share is that many of us have lost time being sick, and we're still dealing with unresolved health issues. And I want to encourage you that God is faithful. He's faithful to his promise and that he works all things together for good to those who love him. And the greatest testimony I could share is that even though I suffered, even as a Christian, I believe we suffer more because when, we, when we're Christians, because the enemy that disguises himself as an angel of light tries not only to deceive those who are already lost so they never find their way, but he is the thief who wants to rob and steal and kill. And he wants to steal from Christians. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your livelihood, your knowledge, everything of, you know, what you could know that's true, all that Jesus did for you. And ultimately he is, he wants you to give up. He wants you to settle. And I almost did that a year ago, but I will say God is faithful. No matter what our circumstances are or why or how we ended up where we are right now, God can use it and he can weave it all together for our good. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So it doesn't matter how sick you are currently. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday or how far off the beaten trail you've gone. He has so much more for you, more than you can ever imagine. And through what he did at Calvary and the Holy Spirit, which is available to work through us, we can have God's knowledge and we can thrive. Remember, the world will lead you astray and the devil disguises himself as an angel of light. But the word of God is living, it's active, it's powerful. And at the very least, give it a try. There's so much you can learn here. I want you to have the gift that Jesus gave us when he died on the cross. And it's so much more than salvation. So thank you so much for listening. And if you were blessed by this message, please give it a thumbs up or consider subscribing to my YouTube channel and share it with your friends. And until next time, God bless you, my friend.